Good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody and those on the live feed to our service this morning. I got a couple of announcements. Fly Super Bowl party at the Jensen's tonight at five o'clock. The uh, Junior Lutherans are welcome to also come to that party. And the Fly Retreat will be February 23rd through the 25th, and that'll be at the Illinois District Bible Camp. Sign up is due today. And also flowers today are given in celebration of Bill and Hildegard Atza's 70th wedding anniversary, which is February 8th. Also, the prayer list has not been filled, so if you haven't picked up a prayer list, please see Tammy, and she will get you one. So is there any other announcements? If not, I'll ask Pastor Steve to come up and conduct our service. Try that. Ooh. So this will be the first time that uh, I've led the common service, and so I appreciate your patience with that. Uh, a, a couple things that I want you to note that will be different uh, with this. And these changes I did on purpose, so you know that it's not just because I didn't know what I was doing, uh, but it was because I did these on purpose. Number one, there will be only three hymns in this service. Uh, the second thing is that there won't be a closing hymn. And the last part of it that I'd like you to note is that during communion, this will be a time for silent reflection. So there will be no hymns played at that time. The purpose of that is to spend time in reflection on God's, uh, on your own sin, and then on God's grace in which has freed you from that sin and his gift of eternal life. So that being said, let us begin our service this morning. Would you please rise? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God, our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our maker and redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed, whereupon we come for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O merci most merciful God, who has given you a holy begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us and has given us his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To them that believe on his name, he gives power to become the sons of God and bestows on them his Holy Spirit, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, O Lord, unto us.
Please be seated. In Troy is on page, uh, the second page in the bulletin, which is Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He will keep you with not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither sleep, slumber, or sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will your all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this day forth and forever. Mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Glory be to God on high. The Lord be with you. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have sown your holy word among us. We pray that you would prepare our hearts by your Holy Spirit that we may diligently and respectfully hear your word. Keep it in our good hearts and bring forth fruit with patience and that we may not incline to sin, but restrain it by your power. And in all per precautions, comfort ourselves with your grace and, continually, and continual help. Through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Call on Dennis at this time to read the Old Testament lesson and the New Testament lesson.
The Old Testament lesson is in Isaiah 55, 10 through 13. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of a thorn shall come up from, up from the cypress, instead of the briar everlasting sign, briar shall come up the myrtle, and it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The New Testament lesson is in 2 Corinthians 11, 19 through 12, 9. For you gladly bear with fools, being wise yourself. For you bear it if someone makes slaves of you, or devours you, or takes advantage of you, or puts on airs, or strikes you in the face. To my shame, I must say, we were too weak for that. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I am speaking as a fool. <clears throat> I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they offspring of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at hands of the Jews, the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was left, I was adrift at sea. And on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, Danger from false brothers, in toll and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure of me and my anxiety for the all churches, who is weak and I am not weak, who is made to fall and I am not indignant. So if I boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness, that God and Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. At Damascus, the governor under King Artus was guarding the city of Damascus in order to seize me. But I let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. I must go on boasting though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven, whether in body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And I know that this man was caught up in to paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. On behalf of this man I will boast, but on my own behalf I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. Though if I should boast, wish to boast, I would not be a fool, I, for I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited because of my surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, 
My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Here ends the lessons. recently changed the lectionary uh, for this year, so we're using the Missouri Senate uh, lessons throughout the year, and this is the first that I read this second pa the second Corinthians passage for today. I hadn't read it until today. I just had put it on reference as I sent the email out. I say that to you because of the astounding connectivity that we'll have with today's sermon, which can only be brought about by the working of God and his Holy Spirit. I am so astounded how often that, that God does that. It seems, like, it seems like it's been happening now almost every week, doesn't it? It's just crazy. So, the Gospels text today, would you please rise, is from Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 15. And when a great crowd was gathered and the people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell upon the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away, because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up, and, it choked, and, it, and with it, it choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And he who has, and, and when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now this parable is this, the seed is the word of God, the, one along, the ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have, not, these have no root, they believe for a while, and in time of testing fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns... They, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life. And their fruit does not mature. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in all honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. Please join together in singing hymn number 539, while you remain standing, hymn, praise him. Oh 
Be seated. We'll call on the children at this time for the children's message. So I'm a little more nervous today just because I'm not used to the service. And so now I'm more nervous for the children's message. So I hope you made it easy on me. Did you make it easy? We'll find out. Have a seat, John. Oh, James. <laughs> Who knows those guys? <laughs> oh, boy. Stormtrooper. That's a good one. Yeah, do you like stormtroopers? Okay, so here's the deal. Our stormtroopers, this is a stormtrooper, right? It's not a clone, it's a stormtrooper, right? Okay, so is a stormtrooper a good guy or a bad guy? So what are we going to do with them? Kill him. Kill him. <laughs> Shoot him with lasers, kill him. Sounds something like uh, some other people I knew. You know who they were? No. You guys just sounded when, 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 well, one particular person. You know, what, you know what another crowd said to somebody who wasn't a sinner, who wasn't a bad guy? You know what they said? Crucify! So we all know, well, hopefully you all know. Raise your hand if you know that Jesus died for your sins. Raise your hand if you know that. Now, here's the, here's the thing, guys. Who should have died in his place? That's right. You're right. As cute as you are, you're right. Give me five. We all should, right? It should have been our death on the cross for our sin. That's the real bad guy. Who's the real bad guy? <laughs> stormtrooper is correct. Raise your hand if you're a stormtrooper. You're not Luke Skywalker. You want you you wish you were Luke Skywalker. Yeah, we all should have our hands raised because guess what? As much as we want to yell at the bad guy, ooh, you're a bad guy, die. But guess what? Really, honestly, scripture says that there are none righteous, not one. Not a single one of you. Not a single one of us. Apart from Christ, we have no righteousness. And we're just a bad guy, like a stormtrooper. But the beautiful thing is that Christ stood in the place of the stormtrooper's death so that he didn't have to die. So you don't have to die with faith and belief in Christ. Yes, do you have a question? Yeah, that's right. He's got a terrible aim, doesn't he? And you know what? He's like a magnet. He always gets hit. He can never duck or nothing, can he? That's like us. We got no ducking to do when it comes to sin. So... Here you go, buddy. Let's pray. Arms out. Arms out. You're killing me. Arms out. Together. Good job. Dear Heavenly Lord, we're thankful for your life, death, and resurrection. And while some yelled crucified, Lord, and you went to the cross, we've benefited from your death by belief and faith in you. So grant us that belief. Grant us that faith. Teach us to walk in your ways, Lord. And let us feel what it means to be declared righteous by you. Lord, we love you in your holy name. Amen. All right, so there's one man yesterday or last week who said, I haven't had it yet, and I remembered. So here you go, buddy. All right, you guys go have a seat. Oh, okay, yeah, you haven't had it. Somebody recognized that maybe this week, if they said I haven't had it, they would get it next week. <laughs> Let's sing together before our message, uh, hymn number 568, Day by Day.
Please turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 8. We'll be reading from 10 through 15 today. There will be a choir that will be gathering if you'd like to be a part of that. For when we get to chapter 12, we would have a special song that is connected with chapter 12. So if you'd like to be a part of that choir, then you'll want to get with either Kathy or uh, Joyce at some point in time and, and uh, start to begin practicing there. So I'll be excited for that. That was uh, an idea from another congregation member because it's a song that's fitting for chapter 12. But we're several weeks from chapter 12. All right, as we read then from chapter 8. Then I saw the wicked buried, who had come and gone from the place of holiness, and they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This is also vanity, because the sentence against evil work is not exceeded, exceeded speedily. Therefore the heart of the sons of men is full, fully set in them to do evil. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and his days are prolonged, yet I surely know that it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked, nor, with the prolong his, nor will he prolong his days, which are as his shadow, because he does not fear before God. There is vanity which comes on earth, that there are just men to whom it happens according to the works of the wicked, Again, there are wicked men to whom it happens according to the works of the righteous. I said, this is also vanity. So I commended enjoyment, because a man has nothing better under the sun than to eat, drink, and be merry. For this will remain with him in his labor all the days of his life, which God, which God gives him under the sun. Let us pray. Lord, we desire to follow you. We desire to be fed by your word and for our souls to be encouraged and nourished today. We know that that is done as we hear your word and as we take part in your holy sacrament. So begin, Lord, in us a kindling of fire, refreshing our soul. Give us faith, Lord, a blaze, Lord Jesus. Let it set a fire in us, in your holy name. Amen. Uh, I could probably write a book uh, of all the things that I have heard from my kids. Uh, one of my sons when he was young, and I didn't tell him I was going to say this. I don't even know if he remembers that he said it when he was younger, but he used to have this phrase. Uh, he would call people he knew and people he didn't know, just strangers walking by. He would look at them and he would say, hello, chicken nugget old lady. And it didn't matter if they were an old lady or not. Everybody was chicken nugget old lady. Uh, one of my favorites is I don't know. If I ever meet this person named I don't know in a dark alley, only one of us is going to come out alive because I don't know is responsible for 98% of the bad things that happen in my home. When I was a kid, the one that I often used was, that's not fair. One time I told my grandma, that's not fair. And her response was, life's not fair, and then you die. And that's the plain truth, isn't it? Life is not fair. And if we look around at the world in which we live in, it flourishes with wickedness. The poor, they seem to be oppressed. Those who are sick and elderly sometimes get pushed into a corner to stare at a wall and forgotten. Even the best of us have suffered and lost their memory, a fate to which I am scared. We might ask the question in all of this, where is God. In all of this, where is God? And Solomon weighs in on this topic today, the idea of the fairness of the world. He weighs in on it today with all of his human wisdom, right? And his sarcastic, similar sarcastic way he's written the rest of the book. He weighs in on the topic. 
So when we look at it today, I want us to look at, uh, look at this portion of scripture. And the title of today's message is, Shall You Take Your Ease? I suppose it could have easily have just been, Life Isn't Fair. But the first point is, Life Isn't Fair. The wicked seemingly go unpunished. And then the second point, and there's only two. While you may be excited that there are only two, hoping that the sermon will be shorter, it is not. The second point is, life isn't fair, shall you take your ease? We begin in verses 10 through 15. And it says in 10 through 15, that the wicked don't seem to get their punishment speedily. And that in there, they both die. We die and they die. And it doesn't seem to make sense that, that the punishment for the sinful, wicked people in this world seems to be prolonged. Solomon makes this point that everybody dies and the punishment for the wicked is prolonged. And because of that, they set their heart against evil. And, and as I read through these verses, I almost felt like I could, I could see an echo from Psalm 73, uh, which I've shared before. One of my favorite psalms, especially there in verse 20. It's 24? I was going to say 26. Here I am, fumbling over my favorite verse, right? Way to go, Pastor Jensen. Psalm 73, though, is that point where he says, I almost sinned because I look around it and I don't understand it. Why do all the wicked and the evil and all this thing happen in the world and they prosper? How can it be so? Why is it that the, the righteous, the believing people of God become oppressed? Why? And I almost caused myself to sin. So there's that echo of Psalm 73. It was verse 26. Life is not fair. Look around. Watch the news. Be a five-year-old kid. You'll know life's not fair. How fair is it that 160 mostly minor girls can be sexually abused by a man while their parents think they're being taken care of and participating in the great sport of gymnastics. Is 170 years in prison a good sentence for such wickedness? I don't believe so. How fair is it that 13 children are abused by their parents, one being at home for the 29 years they're locked, chained, never washed, barely fed. Their minds have been brainwashed and their life has been sucked from them and they are death stricken. Is this fair? Is there a special place in hell for such people? In my heart, my evil heart, that is, I would like to think so. I would like to think that those who harm children get an extra dose of punishment. But I'm reminded of Scripture. Scripture that says, there is none righteous, not one. And I'm reminded of Jeremiah 17, 9. Seth, do you remember what that is? I was, I was going to warn you, but I warned you last week, so I figured that was enough warning. The heart is desperately sick. It's wicked above all things. Who can know it? Who can now throw 
After hearing these things, recognizing the sin of our own life, who can throw the first stone? Before the cross, we don't get to say that we're better and that my sin is not as bad as that person's. Before the cross and before God, we don't get to look over at the person next to us and say, well, at least my sin is not as bad as his. On earth, before men, yes. On earth, before men, you can, you can well say at least to some degree, well, I'm not, I'm not as bad as that. On earth, before men. But before God, you cannot. Before God, we lose such privileges. There's a song, a Christian song that I often like, that says, remind me who I am. And the point of the song is to remind us of who we are in Christ because we often forget. We often forget that our life is hidden in Christ. Wayne, in the heavenlies. Our life is hidden in Christ. However, if I want to be true, if I want to be reminded of who I am, I must not only consider grace. I must first consider the law. Where I know that we are all sinful, that we are all sinners, not one better than another, and life certainly is not fair. But all sin will go punished. You hear that? All sin will go punished. I've used this analogy before. When it comes to sin and my relationship with God, sin is not go unpunished. I don't get to be in the example of me and, and Caleb were outside playing, you know, snowball fight with this slushy snow. And, and Caleb, he throws a really good one. And he hits me right in the eye. And because he's a good kid, right? He's a Van Hoven, a good kid over there. He's going to say, oh, I'm so sorry. I did not mean to hit you in the eye. And out of kindness, I will say, it's okay. I forgive you. It's all right. That is not the relationship between us and God. Sin does not go unpunished. Sin will be punished. The, dis the difference is either Christ will claim that he has paid it because you believe and have faith in Christ to which your sin has been fully paid for on the cross, the wondrous cross. <laughs> or you yourself will pay for each and every one of your sins with an eternal punishment of flame and fire, of weeping and gnashing of teeth. These are not to be overlooked. They are to be understood as a reality. Hell is not fiction. Hell is real. A place of no escape. It's true life isn't fair. The punishment for sin is. The punishment for sin is fair. The gift of eternal life and blessedness by faith in Christ, this is not fair. This is not fair to my God who died. Why should he pay the price for me? For the things that I did? My son and I, Quincy, I'm going to share something. 
We were talking this week about third world countries and how, as far as I know, and some of them it still exists, where if you steal, you get your hand chopped off. And Quincy wasn't sure he agreed that it should be that way. He thought that maybe some grace should be extended. And he felt that way because of the way God has given him grace. And he knows that there are passages that say that you should forgive because Christ has forgiven you. So in all fairness, he was in some state in his right, in his mind. However, if we want to use the analogy correctly, Quincy, then wanting to give grace to that person, would step in his place and have his own hand chopped off for the person who was the thief. It doesn't just get forgiven or forgotten. It gets paid for and is then forgiven. The grace in which you have was not free. It's free to you, but it had a cost. That cost was Christ. I belong to a group. I belong to that group that should find that special place in hell. Because there isn't a special place. And all sin deserves that punishment. I'm no better than anyone else. Because the wages of sin is death. And all sin, every sin, your sin, my sin, every bit of it will be paid. Life isn't fair, and then you die. In verse 15, we read that life isn't fair, but we ask, shall we take our ease? In a sense, what Solomon is saying is here is, you know what? You look around, and what you see is garbage, trash, everything stinks. It's all vanity. It's terrible. So all you've got is what you make of it in your labor. So eat, drink, and be merry. Caleb. What does hermeneutics mean? The way we interpret scripture sounds like somebody gave you the answer beforehand on that one. That was unfair, wasn't it? Sorry, Seth. Yeah, he had a paper. Hermeneutics. It's how we interpret scripture. And Caleb, what's the proper way to use hermeneutics? Scripture should interpret scripture. Specifically, the New Testament interpreting the Old Testament. And we do that because in 2 Corinthians chapter 120, we see, For as many as their promises of God in him, that is Christ, they are yes. All of God's promises, all of scripture is tied up and found its end, its yes, and its amen in Christ. And so therefore the New Testament defines the Old Testament, where the Old Testament in many cases was pointing towards Christ. Sometimes it is, you're able to do this and sometimes you're not. We are today. Let us turn to Luke chapter 12. There's a parable here. If you have not marked this in your Bible and you're a person who does mark in your Bible, I would like you to mark this. For those of you who don't mark in your Bible, you should memorize this passage of Scripture. Write it down. Put it on your doorpost where you come and where you go. Or maybe on your bathroom mirror for a short period of time to help you memorize it. If you do that, though, use a dry erase marker, not a permanent one. Heads up. This is what it says. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yield plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will put, pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crop and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. And God said to him, Fool. This night your soul will be required of you. 
Then we'll, this will be the things which you have provided. So he who will lay up his treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. The idea of eat, drink, and be merry. Christ interpreted that portion of scripture for us. I don't know if he was referring exactly to Ecclesiastes when he said that and in this parable, but it absolutely helps to define it. For those of us who feel that all we have is what we make of it, with our own strength and might, that our life consists of what we can milk out of it. I wanted to make a hand gesture of milking there, but I've never milked a cow. So maybe next time, Steve, you can teach me. That'll help. Our life, our life is not just what we make of it. Not how hard we live it, what we do within it, as far as our actions are concerned. Because we can gather up all the treasures in the world, but our soul will still...
Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with your solitary gift. And we ask you of your mercy to strengthen us through the same gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Ghost, one God, world without end. The Lord be with you. Give you his peace. Oh.